Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. <clears throat> this is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And this week, we have a very physical episode. So our opener, Rachel Chu, is going to talk about her secret paper this year on physics informed neural fields for smoke reconstruction with sparse data. And our headliner, Professor Sharon Gerbaldi, is will talk about uh, plants in motion, turbulent paddles, and winding tendrils. As usual, if you have any questions, please leave those questions in the YouTube live chat. So first, it's my great pleasure to introduce our opener, Rachel. So she's a postdoc researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics, supervised by Professor Christian Thibault and uh, Rahala uh, Sayer. Uh, before that, she obtained her PhD at the Technical University of Munich with Professor uh, Nies Ter Terry. And her research focused on machine learning and fluids, especially for smoke simulation. And every year at SIGGRAPH, she always surprises us with new capabilities of machine learning for smoke simulation. For example, how can we use machine learning to upsample a low resolution smoke simulation to a very detailed and high resolution one? And how can we continue to simulate a smoke given only a single time frame of the smoke density without other, for example, velocity data? So today, she will also bring us another very eye opening application of machine learning in doing smoke simulation. She will introduce her latest secret paper this year, which shows us how can we combine physics and the neural radiance field to do smoke reconstruction. So please join me to welcome Rachel. Thank you very much for the really nice introduction. And let me share my screen. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully I guess you can see my screen now. Yeah, I would like to, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and I'm really happy to introduce our new project on the physics informed neural fields for smoke reconstruction with sparse data. So let's start. So at the beginning, I would like to explain the background of our work. So fluid is everywhere in our daily life and they are playing important roles in many activities. These activities including complex business such as the design of a vehicle in the picture. So we see a wind tunnel test in it. We are also dealing with fluid in very common daily activities, such as these communications between people. As shown in this Lyran image, we talk, we exhale air flows, and we get our voice delivered. So in these activities, uh, in this wide range of activities, it will be very helpful if we can analyze and understand our complex fluid behavior with some tools. So do we have such tools to measure fluid motion at the moment? Yes, but not as convenient as we want. The PIV, particle image velocimetry, velocimetry method is one of the most established methods in industry at the moment. In this method, we inject special particles into the target flow. We light them up using some laser and check them with some special cameras. So due to this special setup, we cannot easily apply them to measure an arbitrary fluid motion in our daily life. Now we see the challenge for the fluid reconstruction. We want to capture fluid motion, which are complex uh, physical phenomena, and, but we want to use simple setups, which may not provide sufficient constraints. So this demand makes it a promising direction to reconstruct fluid from RGB videos. That's also what we are dealing with with our current project. So let's take a look at the recent progress in video-based scene uh, reconstruction first. Uh, for us, fluid reconstruction methods are most relevant. They provide physical reasonable uh, result by considering the underlying physical equations. However, these works are usually limited to simple scenes with fluid as the main target and cannot support arbitrary lighting conditions and other uh, conditions. Uh, in the wild. For scene reconstruction, 
Uh, NERF proposed a continuous neural representation that only supports static things. And neural volumes encode dynamic things in inverse mapping, but does not provide velocity or consider physical constraints. So in our work, our goal is to provide physically plausible reconstruction of hybrid things, including not only fluids, but also obstacles in arbitrary shapes. We also want to relax the constraints and support things with unknown lighting conditions or obstacles in unknown shapes. So that's the background of the project. And to achieve this goal, we propose a continuous implicit neural fluid representation. In the first place, let's take a look at the input and output of our method. So the only input of our method is shown here. Uh, so it is a sparse site of synchronized RGB videos with known camera poses, like this example video uh, provided by the scalar flow data set. So we have multiple of them from different view uh, point. And based on the input, we use a fully connected neural network to learn the readings distribution in space and in time. Uh, the readings uh, is consistent by uh, density and color, and the relationship between the density and the image sequences are guaranteed via the differentiable ray matching. And this part, we can see it as an extension on the static nerve model to a dynamic one. Uh, we extend along the time dimension to encode time varying neural readings field for dynamic things. Uh, well, differentiable rendering helps the static nerve to model the uh, unified information from different camera poses. It is important for a dynamic nerve uh, to model at different time steps and to unify information at different time steps. So this can be done with this uh, differentiable physics. And here we propose to use another fully connected network to learn the velocity field in space and time. And by by applying physical equations as soft constraints on the fluid density and velocity, uh, we provide the physically plausible neural fluid representation. We optimize the readings and velocity fields simultaneously from image sequence end to end. And all of this are according to the uh, universal approximation theory. So according to the theory, we know that fully connected networks has the ability to approximate uh, continuous high dimensional functions, uh, while we need a good architecture and supervision to achieve such good approximation accuracy. Yeah, okay. Uh, so here are more details about our hybrid architecture, and uh, the, we also provide a comprehensive supervision with the architecture. So on the architecture side, uh, we want to support hybrid things with moving fluid and static uh, obstacles. So we propose to use two uh, fully connected networks to represent the radiance fields. And one network uh, has no other time as input, so it can only support static representations. And the other one with an extension on the time dimension can automatically uh, learn the time varying radiance information. In this way, this hybrid architecture is able to separate static and dynamic component automatically without additional human labeling or obstacle geometry as input. And for the velocity model, uh, we only sample and supervise positions uh, that are not occupied by any static density. So on such an architecture, uh, we propose a comprehensive supervision from images, physical priors, including a transport equation and navi stroke equations. Uh, and finally, uh, we also applied a pre-trained fluid model to use it as a data prior to prevent suboptimal solutions. So we can take a look at more details with some comparisons. So on the image side, we find that after adding VGG loss, uh, the results uh, show more high frequency details. 
And we also notice a special uh, form of artifact, which we name as the ghost density, where the network uh, tries to uh, fake the result by painting empty regions uh, according to the color of the background. So we see all the black smoke in the left figure. And after using this density, uh, uh, ghost density regulation uh, term, we see that this ghost density uh, disappear uh, on the right hand side. And on the, uh, in the velocity field, we see that when we use uh, physical equations as soft constraints, the result uh, should be uh, physically plausible, but they are not necessarily constrained to the ground truth, especially when we optimizing density and velocity simultaneously. We sometimes arrive at suboptimal local minimal with blurry velocity and underestimated vorticity as shown on the left. And uh, by applying a pre-trained model by supervising the vorticity uh, according to the distribution of the uh, model, we can avoid this suboptimal solution and get velocity result with enhanced vorticity. So that's a lot more details. And uh, maybe we can take a look at the results here. So here we uh, compare our result with related work on the synthetic scalar flow data set. And as shown in the result, uh, ours is close to to the ground truth. And the uh, global transport method is very detailed, but show a lot of high frequency uh, noise. And on the other hand, uh, the neural volume method still uh, uh, showing the artifact of the ghost density here. And here uh, we show you more results with obstacles. So uh, I have a method with this uh, hybrid architecture. We can successfully separate the obstacles and the uh, smoke component. And we can also reconstruct the velocity field. And here we show a lot more complex uh, hybrid things. And in this static car, uh, in this dynamic car thing, we have a strong free stream velocity in the thing. And we can see that the velocity is reconstructed. Uh, we see that we roughly reconstructed, but there are still more high frequency details that we can improve in future work. And here is another uh, interesting thing. So you can see that the smoke hitting all the monsters, which the, coll the collision makes the sm smoke motion very complex. Okay, yeah. So. That's all the, about the result. And I want to conclude with some uh, discussions and the future directions of our project. So regarding the contributions, we have proposed uh, a method which can reconstruct uh, complex uh, fluid things, not only including fluid, but also with uh, static obstacles. And our method support relaxed constraints, including unknown lighting conditions and arbitrary obstacles, which was not supported before. Regarding the limitations, one of the most uh, important one is that we still need a very long optimization time, and our method is a per scene optimization process. So, for example, the game thing, the last one, it takes about 64 hours to uh, optimize, so it, it's still a very long time. And we are still uh, want to improve our result on the high frequency details. And regarding the future directions, I see it as a very uh, strong potential for uh, future directions. Uh, uh, for example, it will bring us closer to the in the wild things, which will give us more chance uh, to know about the real physics in the world. And we are interested with more fluid and obstacle interactions, such as moving obstacles, and also for multi-physics things, including not only a smoke, liquid, fire, and many other physical things. So that's all about uh, our talk today. And I would like to uh, share you uh, with some questions later on. So I'm also interested in the uh, next talk. Thank you, Rachel, for this fantastic talk and also a lot of these beautiful uh, videos. So as usual, we will proceed to talk about headliner and have a joint Q&A session at the end. So our headliner, uh, Sharon Gerboldi, is a professor at Harvey Mudd University. 
Her research focused on soft matter physics, which focused on studying fundamental physics principles of soft materials. For example, the one I found fascinating is the about the coiling behavior of the tendril. So Professor Gabaldi's research is not only an important one in physics, she also demonstrated many applications in engineering and material science, including new possibilities of harnessing energy from humidity, which I have completely no idea how that is possible. So in addition, I believe her research will also be a very inspiring one for graphics people because it laid out the foundation to develop new algorithms to simulate some behaviors that we cannot possibly simulate before. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Professor Sharon Gavodi. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I've got a bit of background noise. Hopefully you're not hearing it too much. Um, so welcome. I am so delighted to be here. And Rachel, I very much enjoyed listening to your presentation. I'm a physicist by training, but this work has brought me at the intersection of many different fields. I did indeed work with computer scientists around the same time as I was working on these projects, as well as mathematicians and biologists. So I'll put on um, a little bit of my biology hat today to talk to you about, hopefully if we have time, two projects here that are both about geometry and shape change in plants. And um, so the first is about these beautiful columbine flowers that you see on the left. And the second will indeed be about those cucumber tendrils that Derek mentioned. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so these beautiful columbine flowers have characteristic petals with these long spurs. If we look over on the right here, each of these uh, very pink petals on this flower have extremely long tubular pockets. And those pockets have a bit of nectar in the bottom. And one of the remarkable things about these flowers is that they have co-evolved along with pollinators. So the shape of this pocket in the pink flower on the right is matched to the shape of the beak of this hummingbird. And similarly, the other types of these columbine flowers have differently shaped spurs, they're called, which again, match the beak or proboscis, which just means tongue for an insect um, of whatever pollinator uh, most commonly frequents that flower. So it's a beautiful example of a coevolution. Um, so Darwin was, someone who early on was fascinated by these nectar spurs. There is one plant uh, called Darwin's orchid, uh, which has these extremely long characteristic nectar spurs. And Darwin predicted in 1962, you know, why on earth would this flower have such an absurd looking nectar spur? And he said, there must be some creature that pollinates this flower that has a proboscis just the right size and shape to fit in there and suck up the nectar at the bottom of the spur. What's the advantage to the flower? Well, of course, they have to get just close enough that they rub up against uh, the pollen. And then as they move from one flower to the next, they pollinate. So that's the advantage for the plant and the advantage for the insect or whichever pollinator is to drink the delicious nectar and get that energy. So Darwin predicted there must be some beast that has a proboscis long and skinny enough to fit in this. Uh, in 1882, sadly he died without ever knowing whether or not there is such a moth. Um, and in 1903, it was discovered and it was named the predicted moth after Darwin's prediction, uh, 21 years after he passed. So it's a beautiful classic example. And here's a little image of an actual uh, moth, hawk moth, they're now called commonly, coming and drinking nectar from a nectar spur from one of Darwin's orchids. Um, so what's interesting about these columbine, or their scientific name is aquilegia flowers, is that there's a great diversity of them. They don't all have long skinny spurs. As we showed in the first slide, there are different shapes and sizes. And in fact, there is an aquilegia that gets visited by that uh, predicted moth, the hawk moth, with its extremely long proboscis. So in each of these images, I'm highlighting for you the length of the spur, two centimeters for the one that gets visited by bees, and so on. Um, so in biology, 
these spurs are an example of what's known as a key innovation. So this is when in evolution, a new feature evolves that um, allows for a rapid diversification. For example, in this case, a diversification of the flower to have a whole bunch of different spurs, different species of the same type, the same genus with differently shaped spurs. And so having this key innovation of a spur allowed it to become specific to different pollinators. And that led to the proliferation of different species that live in different regions with different pollinators. So this is a very important concept in evolutionary biology. And therefore, one of the major goals is to understand how do these spurs arise? And perhaps more excitingly, how did they diversify? And so that's where we came in. Oh, yes. And when, when I say this is something people care about a lot in, uh, you know, in evolutionary biology, this is a great example of, you know, textbook that diversity is the effect of the production and so on and so forth. So this, this really is textbook biology here. So I'm told I'm only a physicist. Um, so this is an example of a phylogenetic tree. Aqualegia up here on the top those are the columbine flowers that we're studying. And you can see that unlike the next neighbor here, semi-aqualegia, which only has a single species, aqualegia is this nice big tree with lots of different options. And that's because of this key innovation of a spur. Okay, so hopefully this movie will play for us. So I'm an experimentalist, um, and the first thing we did was to set up time-lapse videography to just take images of these flowers as they grow. And I hope you can see that the spurs are elongating as it grows, and eventually the flower will open. Um, and so what happens is that at first, the, the petal that eventually elongates into the spur is flat, and then it gets a little bit of a cup. And then that cup gets a little pokier and the poke just elongates and elongates and elongates until it's mature. And at this point it opens so that now a pollinator can access it. So this image is showing uh, images of flowers at different developmental stages. It's not the same flower because once we chop it off, well, it's dead. But these are sort of the same type of flower shown at different stages. And you can see over here on the left, there are little tiny green spurs and those elongate and elongate as the flower grows. And the same is true for another species of Aqualegia, the one with the short spurs. Um, so really the accepted paradigm for how this shape change or morphogenesis shape change and growth is occurring in these, um, was driven by a really common idea, a common type of growth in biology called meristematic growth. growth. And it works like this. At the tip of an object, so think of a stem growing on a plant, for example, there's an active area right at the tip um, where cell divisions are taking place. And so in this sort of meristematic growth, lots of cell divisions take place. So to create new cells, and then those cells grow. And so it's sort of like you're adding material brick by brick at the very tip of the object. And that's what leads to growth. And so the hypothesis was that the petal starts flat. Then there's this localized region of cell divisions that happen at the site of this, as it's called, apical meristem. And then that causes this little pouch and basically cell by cell, more and more material gets added on, okay, to create eventually this long spur. And so the question was, given this sort of apical meristem type of growth, what is making the difference between the ones with really long spurs and the ones with short spurs? And so the thought was that more cells are created for the ones that are long than for the ones that are short. So we came along and uh, my collaborator, Josh, who was a plant biologist, took beautiful microscope images of these petals. And we looked at them under the microscope. Um, so remember, 
uh, that plant cells have cell walls. And unlike animal cells that are motile and can move relative to one another, plant cells are stuck inside their cell walls. And so it's like a rigid structure that's all stuck together. The cells never change place. Um, and what you can see in this image on the left, these sort of funky jigsaw puzzle shaped cell walls that are standing out. And we noticed that unlike the cells up at the top of the petal, which were roughly round, uh, the cells in the elongated part of this long spur had a very high aspect ratio, which we use epsilon to represent. So the length divided by the width was very high. Um, and so if we looked at how these evolved through time, we were interested to see is it really more cells being added or are the cells themselves just stretching out? So um, a couple of things I wanna tell you about here, notation wise. So to be able to compare among different nectar spurs, we need a little coordinate system. So we measure our arc length S from the very tip of the spur, measuring up to this little pointy bit here on the left. Can you see my uh, mouse here? Great. Uh, so over here on the left where it says Z equals one, that's the place where the petal attaches to the rest of the flower. So we kept track of position along the spur by looking at arc length divided by the total length. So Z is a dimensionless number. It starts at zero at the tip, goes to one at the place where the petal attaches. Okay, oh, sorry. One more thing I wanted to mention here. We can also keep track of the area of each cell by just multiplying length by width. And that's a pretty good proxy for the volume of the cell because uh, the third dimension stays constant through time. So that's what's being shown here on the right. The thickness of the spur does not change. It's just a single th cell thick and that isn't changing as it grows. Uh, so one of the things that we noticed, I'm just moving my zoom controls so I can see what you are seeing. Okay. Um, one of the things that we noticed is that the number of cells does change over time. So cells are being added. The horizontal axis down here is the length of the spur, which is a proxy for developmental age because as it grows, the longer it gets. So think of this as sort of a time axis. And the vertical axis is showing us the number of cells on the spur. And so there is a phase of rapid cell proliferation where cells are being added at the beginning. But that happens very quickly. And then most of the elongation occurs with a constant number of cells, which seems to be suggesting something other than the accepted meristematic growth picture. Um, and so we also noticed that as we look at position along the cell, the cell shape changes. So up at the top where uh, Z is close to one, the cells really do look like sort of isotropic but jigsaw puzzle looking <laughs> shapes. In the middle, they're slightly elongated and at the tip, they're very elongated. So aspect ratio changes along the length of the spur, but it also changes through time as it grows. So this plot here up on the top right is demonstrating, so on the axis that goes sort of from right to left, the Z axis, that's showing us position on the spur with Z equals zero being at the tip. Uh, this axis that's sort of going into the screen uh, from zero to 50 millimeters, that's telling us time. And so we start out at the beginning of the developmental stage, this little yellow guy all the way here on the left with something that has uniformly sort of not very, uh, not very, anisotropic cells. And then over time, the cells get more and more stretched and they do so in sort of a non-uniform way. And if we look at sort of what is the maximum uh, aspect ratio of a cell at each moment in time and just plot that, that's what we have here on this lower plot. And we see that really the thing that tells us about growth is not the number of cells, but their aspect ratio. And so the more stretched the cells get, the longer the spur gets, which all seems very straightforward from a geometry standpoint. But from a biology standpoint, this really upended things because everyone really believed in this meristematic growth theory, which disagrees with what we're seeing here. Um, so 
we looked at the shape of these spurs as they grow through time. So this is just a radius versus sort of position on the spur here. Um, and here we're not plotting position on the spur using Z because we want to actually see it growing. So this is really just position in millimeters, not unitless. Um, and so this shows the time evolution of a spur. Um, and in order to really understand and predict how that shape should change during development, we wanted to be able to combine what we were measuring at the cellular level with the macroscopic shape. So we started by taking sort of a young spur and measuring its radius as a function of position, and then just sort of pretending that it was perfectly symmetric, okay? So that gave us an initial shape. Then we took cell aspect ratio and cell area um, and sort of broke down an average cell aspect ratio and cell area in like 15 equal chunks along the length of the spur. And then we took the initial shape and evolved it through time, sort of within each of these 15 chunks, according to the information that we had from the cellular, cellular level in that region. So for example, just looking at this aspect ratio data, that means that the chunks near the top where the um, petal attaches to the flower elongate through time, but not very much. And the chunk farther down toward the tip elongates much more. Okay, so we just take that data from the cells and use it to predict how that shape should change just using purely geometry. And that gives us these dots. Okay, so the dots down here at the bottom are the prediction based on just, you know, making a really coarse approximation to the initial shape and growing it accordingly. And that gives us something, you know, not terribly far off. And if we use that to then draw a three-dimensional shape for the spur, what we get is this image on the left here. So this is just taking those same dotted curves from before and rotating them about the vertical axis to get a nice, pretty three-dimensional shape. Um, and if instead we just swell everything uniformly using just our area data and ignoring cell anisotropy, we get something that does not at all match the growth of these petal spurs. So cell anisotropy is crucial here and it's something that had been overlooked. So how's that actually attained? Well, it turns out that cell walls are constructed um, by these really rigid fibers. And those fibers are informed about where they should be by this other structure called microtubules. Um, so the microtubules form this pattern that is sort of like belts on the cell. So it turns out in these cells, the microtubules make rings that you know circumnavigate, I guess is the word, uh, the cell like a bunch of little belts. And those instruct these stiff fibers, the cellulose microfibers, how to grow. And so if you take a balloon and put a bunch of rigid rings around it and then inflate it, it's going to elongate instead of swelling in the horizontal direction. And that's just what happens. Uh, my plant biologist buddy, Josh, had this wonderful stuff that we could smear on a flower that would disrupt the way the microtubules organize themselves. And uh, sure enough, if we smeared some of that onto a young spur, so let me tell you what you're looking at here. The image in panel A on the left is a regular spur without that goo that disrupts microtubules on it. So it grows to be nice and long and skinny. And the one on the right is a spur from the same flower that had that stuff spread on it when it was young. And so, the cells that form are shown on the bottom. So the wild type, which is what WT means, the regular spur gets those characteristic elongated cells that look like a jigsaw puzzle. And the poor cells of the one on the right just turn into beautiful isotropic blobs. And so sure enough, we're able to disrupt this and basically destroy the production of the long spurs. So I think, at this point, we've sort of answered how, how does this morphogenesis take place within the flower? Um, and the answer is by tuning cell anisotropy, which is probably ultimately a process of telling microtubules what to do. So if biologists want to understand more about this key innovation, instead of looking at meristematic growth, they can look instead toward 
you know, something that controls microtubules. Um, but interestingly, the diversity question, so there are all these aquilegia flowers with a bunch of different shaped spurs. Can we also understand that by looking at cell anisotropy? And so to answer that question, uh, we took samples from all these different types of aquilegia flowers, and we looked at the number of cells over time for each of them, and lo and behold, they all have the same number of cells. It's not a difference in number of cells. Um, and instead, and if we look at how the area of the cells changes over time, it really does not correlate to the overall length. So A longissima is the longest one, A vulgaris is the shortest one, and the shortest one here actually has the biggest increase in cell size. Okay, so it's definitely not that, but if we look at this as a function of cell anisotropy, that matches, correlates really clearly with how long the spurs are. So not only is cell anisotropy responsible for how these grow, but that is also responsible for that key innovation of determining the diversity of these beautiful flowers. Um, okay, one, one more note before I jump, let me look at the clock, <laughs> before I jump to the next one. Um, remember this phylogenetic tree in the beginning, uh, and there was aquilegia with this big, you know, all these different species, and then semi-aquilegia. I say that's the deadbeat older sibling. It came first, like three million years first, but it never, you know, developed into a bunch of different species. Why? Well, it actually also forms those little spur cups. Remember the first phase of the growth where it's just a cup? And in fact, it does all the cell proliferation part, all the meristem part where it's like making a bunch of new cells, that works. The difference between semi-aquilegia that did not diversify and aquilegia that did is that semi-aquilegia cells always stay isotropic. They never become anisotropic. So that was the key difference that made aquilegia so much more successful than semi-aquilegia. Okay. Um, so I better switch gears if I wanna tell you anything about cucumber tendrils. I hope that you can see this video that's playing. Um, so all the videos in this part are sped up. Uh, what, what is a useful way of saying this? So do you see how one of those tendrils is just searching around like this? That motion is called circumnutation. Each of those periods is about 45 minutes. I think that's the most useful way for me to tell you what the frame rate is here. Um, and what you're seeing in this video is a single tendril that successfully grabbed onto that little piece of bamboo. And once it grabs on, the straight tendril coils into a set of two helices. Um, and those two helices are joined at the middle right here by this thing that Darwin named a helical perversion, which is just a very Victorian <laughs> way of saying something. Um, and so these plants, uh, what can I tell you about them? They are extremely successful. They do not put any energy into making strong, sturdy trunks because they just grow on top of other things. Um, and so they're extremely successful because of this tendril that searches, grabs, and ultimately coils. The coiling pulls the plant up both toward whatever thing it's climbing on and importantly toward the sun. So it can gain an edge over other plants by getting up high to catch all the sunlight. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you lots of videos of these. So this is just another example of the first part where that tendril is straight-ish and it's swinging around looking for something to grab onto. That's the circumnutation part. And then over here, uh, kind of a closer look of what happens when it's grabbing on. Uh, and a lot of people have studied this, the curling of the tip, sort of how does it sense that it's touching something and then how does it curl to grab on? The part that I was most fascinated by was after that happens, how does it coil? And I always thought from childhood that those coils looked like springs. I used to play with them. And I've always been curious, what kind of spring is it? It turns out it's a really weird kind of spring. So let's see if we can get there in the time remaining. Oh, another video. This one's even faster. 
just to show how the whole process works. So it whips around wildly, grabs onto something, and then just coils to pull closer and closer. Okay. And all right. So many people have studied this. I think the first person uh, to publish something on it was Linnaeus back in 1751 in the Philosophia Botanica. Darwin famously was the one to explain why there must be a helical perversion. And perhaps you're already thinking about it because it's a geometric constraint. So uh, hmm, I don't have something, I'll use this necklace that I happen to have here. So if you have, I'll hold it like this, so hopefully you can see. If you have a straight object that is clamped at both ends and you want it to be helical, the total twist in this starts out zero, right? And then as it kind of winds around and around, however much, now I have to use my hands, however much it winds around in one direction, say right-handed, it has to unwind left-handed by the same amount to maintain that geometric condition that it's not twisted overall. So you always get a right-handed coil connected to a left-handed coil of approximately equal turns. It turns out that the tissue is soft enough, it can manage having a little bit more twist than it should have in one direction. So he explained the geometry of that. Um, other people have worked on over the years, this one at the top right is trying to understand uh, the sensitivity to touch. This one on the bottom left is understanding the growth as it grabs on. Mathematicians like Alain Gorelli has have worked on looking at straight rods turning into beautiful helical shapes. Um, and this was the team that I worked on when I was at Harvard on this tendril stuff. Um, so at the time when I was working on this, we just learned something new uh, in the biology world about these tendrils, which is that if you chop a tendril and look at its cross section, it has this ribbon running through it of these special kind of cells that are called gelatinous fiber cells. I'm looking at the clock. Okay. Um, so gelatinous fiber cells are neat. They happen all the time in trees, hardwood trees. And again, it's the story of the microtubules that direct stiff cellulose fibers about how to grow in the cell wall. And essentially, depending on the angle of those cellulose microfibrils, we saw in the last part of the talk that if they're like belts, then that will cause elongation. Um, if they're vertically oriented along the long axis of the cell, then as the cell swells with water, which is what cells do, it will spread out radially. And if they're tilted at an angle, it can actually cause twisting, okay? Um, so we took a look, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through this part because it's a lot of experimental biology stuff that my brilliant collaborator, the same collaborator Josh did, we chopped up some of these cells and compared, uh, sorry, some of these tendrils and compared how their cells looked sort of before and after coiling. And basically uh, this blue thing that you see here in the middle wasn't there before. And that's important because it tells us that the cells are changing shape inside just the ribbon. So this taught us that the change in shape of this tendril was actually being governed by the change of shape of this stiff ribbon that was embedded inside of the rest of the squishy material of the tendril. So that got us really fascinated about these ribbons inside and we figured out how to extract them. And it turns out they're actually quite beautiful and clear and iridescent and they have a very distinctive curvature and shape to them. Um, and if you zoom in, you can, this is with a microscope, so you can see these sort of threads along the long direction of the ribbon, and those are very long cells. All right. Um, so to cut straight to it, <laughs> the way that it works is that it's actually exactly two layers of cells in this ribbon. And when the trigger to coil happens, one side of the cells shrink lengthwise and the other side doesn't. So it's a ribbon of two layers where one side shrinks relative to the other. The ribbon also has this um, celery-like curvature in the other direction that got us distracted for a long time, but it seems to not be important. 
Okay, so when the red side shrinks relative to the white side, then it changes into this helical shape. And that's controlled by water. So this is one of those little ribbons that we extracted. And first we're gonna dry it out, then we'll stick it in water and rehydrate it. So as it dries, that actually changes the length of one side relative to the other. And when you rehydrate it, it unwinds again. Hopefully you all saw that. Maybe I'll run through it one more time. So hydration is a key factor in sort of changing the shape of the two layers of the ribbon. Uh, so we started making things out of rubber and glue. Uh, we took a piece of rubber and stretched it until it was long. And then we squirted some silicone caulk on it, keeping it stretched and smoothed it out so it was the same thickness and then let it cure. And so now we have a ribbon where one side of the ribbon would really like to be shorter and the other side is happy being long. And so if you, once the silicone has cured, once you release this, it's a situation just like we saw with the tendrils and you get curvature uh, where you can ignore all the mathematical symbols on this. Uh, you can, it's the picture tells you everything. Um, okay, and I have a movie to show of this. So give me just a moment while I try and uh, get that up and running. Okay, so let's see. Oops, one more try here as I open it with the correct app. Okay. And you guys are just gonna have to cut me off because there's so much to say. All right, let's see if I can share screen and make this work. Um, okie dokie, here we go. So hopefully you are seeing this video. So this is one of those rubber strips, the sort of orangey side and the clear side, and it's clamped with these two alligator clamps. And if we let one alligator clamp move toward the other, lo and behold, it forms that shape just like the tendril does. And we see also the helical perversion, as Darwin called it, forming exactly because of that clamped boundary condition. Okay, now if I play this backwards, which I think I've learned how to do, this is the silliest thing ever, but let me play it backwards. If I take this, obviously, it's just gonna reverse what it did before, right? So if I take one of these helical things and pull on it, it's just gonna flatten out again, obviously. Uh, but look what happens when we do it with the real plant. So let me share screen. Oh, I've got to reopen that. Okay. Let me show you this. All right. Share screen. Let's try one more time. Sorry, everyone. Okay, this is a little tricky to see. So this is a ribbon that we've extracted. Do you see it? It's kind of white. All right, Derek sees it. This is good. And we pull on it. Can you see what it's doing? So what, what would we expect? We expect, you know, it formed by having one side shrink relative to the other to make this shape. So if you pull on it, it seems like it should just unwind. But what it does is it actually winds up even more. It winds up even more. And this puzzled us for a very long time. I think I'm supposed to end in two minutes. Is this correct? You can still take, take more time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out. Careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's see how much I can tell you about this. Um, all right. Not used to 40 minutes. Okay. Share screen. Here we go. So just to show you a snapshot, if we take our little physical model and stretch it out, it just unwinds. And if we pull on one of these biological tissues, it overwinds. So this on the left is uh, counting the number of sort of, I don't know which one it is, right-handed, I think left-handed turns was five to begin with and seven right-handed turns. And after we pull it, it adds one more on each side. So this is, Apparently, this is a thing that happens. It happens with DNA. It already had a name. It's called overwinding. But we could not figure out why it was happening. And by the way, it's not just the ribbon. If we get a really old, crunchy 
tendril, those do it too, but the young juicy ones don't. The young juicy ones unwind the way you would expect based on rubber. So what the heck causes overwinding? And this was, you know, many months of agony. Um, oh, I've got to show another video. Maybe I won't. Uh, okay, so it turned out that if I glued to my little rubber thing, a fabric ribbon on the inside, okay? And then I pulled that, that did overwinding. And uh, I was delighted that we discovered this by trying experiments. <laughs> and I brought this to my theorist advisor and said, ha ha, we solved it. Now you tell me why it works. <laughs> um, and, and the short answer is that it has a very high bending stiffness relative to the twisting stiffness. And I'll do my best to show you some pictures. This will be all geometry, no physics, um, to try and explain why this works. And maybe this is the last thing I get to do. Um, so this is a helix. The curvature of the helix, which we can think of as being, I probably don't have to tell you this, but one over the radius of a circle that matches. Okay, so that curvature is related to this radius R of the helix and the pitch, which is the difference, uh, the distance between subsequent turns of the helix. And it's related in this way here, whereas the twist is also related to the pitch and the radius. So if we imagine elongating this helix here, we could do so in a way that allows no twist, or we could do so in a way, uh, sorry, that allows no change in twist, I should say, or we could do so in a way that allows no change in curvature. Um, and if the bending stiffness is really high, then that means no change in curvature. And if the twisting stiffness is really high, it means no change in twist. So let me just show you, I'm gonna make that smaller. So let's imagine this is our original helix shape and we're not even bothering with helical perversions right now, okay? Just a single helix. So this happens to have six turns. So imagine we stretch it uh, with clamped ends so it can't change its twist, all right? And so in that case, we just elongate it and we keep six turns. That would correspond to it's not allowed to twist, so this bending stiffness must be a lot less than the twisting stiffness. It's the limit that that ratio is, you know, goes to zero. Uh, or, and this is the harder one for me to think through, but this is what's happening in the tendrils. We have the other limit where the twisting stiffness is really, really uh, low compared to the bending stiffness. So remember, this curvature depends on both radius and pitch. As we stretch, we're increasing pitch. The way to uh, maintain the same curvature is to change both pitch and radius together to maintain uh, the same curvature. And so that means actually shrinking the radius and adding, no, not shrinking the radius, changing the radius in such a way that we essentially add more turns. Um, so we change both of them together and that means twisting, which is allowed because the twisting stiffness is low. So then once we had that figured out using just geometry, we did some little minimal models that I'll play for you. So this is, um, so the idea is this, you have two of these helices and the importance of the helical perversion is it allows twist to take place, right? That's the difference between having two clamped ends and having a clamped end with a perversion in the middle. So that allows twist to take place. So here, this one on the top, uh, Andy did these simulations. Uh, the one on top has bending stiffness less than twisting stiffness. And so that one we expect will just unwind. And the one on the bottom should be like our tendrils. And let's see if both of them can play at the same time. So this is just minimizing bending and twisting energy over time as we apply a force on these two connected helices that have equilibrium curvature and twist. And sure enough, the one with the bending stiffness overwinds. Sorry, the bending stiffness much greater than twisting stiffness. Um, and so as we tune the bending stiffness relative to the twisting stiffness, we can go from this red curve at the bottom, which says, I just unwind. So delta L is how much we've stretched it. Delta N is the change in the number of turns to as we turn up bending stiffness, we go to overwinding. Um, and it turns out, I'm just going to ignore all of that and go to here. 
let this play again, because it's fun to look at, it turns out that that overwinding behavior makes the spring mechanically extremely interesting. Uh, and it turns out that the presence of that helical perversion means that for small stretches, uh, the helical perversion actually makes it softer as a spring, more stretchy. And for big stretches, it actually makes it much, much stronger than it would have been without the helical perversion. So I could make up something biological, which is probably totally fake, uh, which would say, Maybe that's useful for the plant, right? Maybe if an animal brushes by it gently, you know, it wants some flexibility, right? But if something very serious happens, it wants to be strong. Now, I have not done a proper study of the biology there, but I think it's very interesting. And we actually ended up patenting, my only patent, um, a design for a spring based on this cucumber tendril. So I better stop it there. I, I'm sure I've gone over it yet by five minutes. So thank you so much. For your attention. Yeah, thank you for this super, super, super interesting talk. So, so we will uh, we will start our joint Q and A for both speakers. And in the meantime, uh, please continue to post questions in the YouTube chat if you still have one. So we will give uh, Professor Gabaldi a few a few short break, and we'll start with a question for Rachel. So there's a clarification question from the YouTube about how uh, the Navier-Stokes equation is used to supervise the physics in your problem in, in your model. So in our model, we have uh, two fully connected networks, one for the radiance field and one for the velocity field. So the good thing for a fully connected network is that it is able to provide us the uh, differentiable terms. So with the uh, navier stokes equations, we have normal terms, we have de derivatives, and we can uh, calculate them using the auto differentiation from the network and uh, add them up according to the navier stokes equations. And we have an L2 loss so that the navier stokes equation on the left hand side should be uh, as close as possible to zero. So that it is applied as a loss to the optimization uh, and using an L2 term. Yeah. I, I see. So, so basically, you basically calculate the derivative information from your network and add that navier stokes equation as a loss function that you, you say the, the field produced by your network needs to satisfy that. In the L2 yeah, sense. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got right. it. And there's also another uh, like uh, technical questions about about your approach. Is that we wonder how important it is to split the network into like a static one and a dynamic one because theoretically, like uh, like the network should be able to like handle both at the same time. Although in practice, this is typically not the case. But we wonder how important it is uh, in your setup. Uh, so in our setup, the good thing for this uh, hybrid structure is that we can support uh, static obstacles and moving uh, smoke uh, automatically. So, so the network will first try to represent things with the static model, and we gradually add this dynamic one. So the time varying information will automatically be learned by the uh, dynamic model. So it will simplify the task if uh, we don't need any human labeling things. Uh, and it will be interesting in the future. So if we want to deal with like uh, multi-dynamic things, so not only static obstacles, but moving smoke as well as moving obstacles. And then we would need something that can uh, separate the dynamics according to its own um, yeah, thing. So it, it will be a bit more complex thing. So, so currently I think supporting a static obstacle is already a thing that never done before and it opens a wide uh, application already for fluid with uh, static obstacles. Okay, thank you for this detailed uh, answer. So now we come back with ping pong back with the questions for Professor Gabaldi is that there are, actually there are many questions related to, <clears throat> to the figures and then the, the structure you show and one of them is about the boundary shape of this the cell of the spur. Is there any reason or advantage that this, the, the boundary cell boundaries are so complex. It's not, not unlike like simple polygon or circular shapes, like so many like, you know, jiggling kind of complex uh, shape there. Uh, that's a question I wondered myself and asked my biology friends <laughs> when I was working on the project. So it, it's because the cells swell over time. So you need, but the cell walls cannot change their area very easily. 
So you need to start with a wrinkly cell so that as it grows, it becomes smooth. Mm -hmm. So so it basically is that try to keep those uh, like uh, extra lens so that so that you have the room to, for, for them to grow in the future, is that right? Exactly. And then if I you see. do the stiffness of the wall, then you can predict the wavelength of the ripples, you know, roughly. Um, so yeah, even for different cells of different sizes, if it's the same material, they tend to have the same wavelength ripple. But yes, it's all just sort of having that extra length in the edges so that it has room to expand. Got it, got it. And the next question is also related to the, uh, the same topic is that we wonder if there's any uh, energy minimization perspective to this problem. For example, like the flower wants to, for example, minimize this tension and maximize how long it was without breaking it. Or is there any like actual energy formula that that the shape of, of the structure is happens to be a minimizer of that energy? Um, was this a question for the flower part? Or oh, the, the, the first part, the, the, the yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So uh, the the elongation, which is what is driving the spur formation, is just driven by water flow from a, like into a hydrophilic material. So it's actually a, energy is not a big concern at that point. All the energy uh, has been spent in doing the cell divisions and creating all the cell walls early on. And then the elongation is almost a passive process. Mm. Um, certainly the plant is using energy to take in water from the soil and so on, but it, it, it doesn't match with sort of an energy minimization in the way that I may think of things from a physics perspective, a thermal system that's exploring sort of a free energy landscape. I, that doesn't seem to be as useful a description for this system. Got it, got it. Thank you for the explanation. So also to come back with questions for Rachel is that uh, from actually from the talk in this colloquium last week, we saw that there's a need to reconstruct smells from like a general video footage, which consists of buildings or peoples or car or everything. Like we just wonder like that your, whether your approach can support like a general video with a lot of, not the clean video, but with a lot of other obstacles in it. Can you still reconstruct uh, the smokes uh, out of that? Uh, so currently, we only tried hybrid things with smoke and obstacles, and uh, it will be interesting to try things with complex background. Uh, but I think we can take use of more mature developed uh, topics. So people also have the matting approaches to separate mm -hmm. the background with the foreground and also some alpha channels. And I think those uh, could be used as some pre-process for our project, and we would be able to reconstruct the foreground, a uh, foreground, and also get the background information using the pre-processing. Yeah. Wow, well, yeah, I think that that's reasonable because there are so many impressive um, Im image pre-processing or video pre-processing approach out there. Yeah, and yes, next exactly. question is also. Uh, actually, it's a very general question for you, such a like a smoke expert. Uh, so is that, <laughs> we wonder. You. Like because in graphics, a lot of case we want to use like you know, doing smoke in some like more video or video games or like movies, and we want actually want some user constraints on the smoke. For example, I want to add the smoke to flow according to certain paths. We just wonder how easy it is to incorporate those user controls in those kind of deep learning smokes. Uh, in our current project, it's more about uh, reconstruction. So we only reconstruct according to images. So uh, regarding uh, smoke control, uh, I think it's more related to some like generative models. And when you have a model to generate a different kind of smoke, we have some uh, different input as uh, different conditions that you can use to control the things. So yeah, <laughs> I would like to mention a uh, previous paper from me <laughs> in 2020's graph. So we also deal with uh, how to control uh, smoke things. So it is possible when we learn different uh, fluid information, learn the relationship between them and people who would be able to turn on, uh, do modification on some uh, data and the network could transfer this kind of modification to some other data and we would get the whole set of data that we can do simulation with. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you for that. And people should check out your the, the previous. <laughs> thank <I> you. <laughs> I would appreciate yeah. that. Okay. And, and come back with questions for Professor uh, 
Godobi. So is that uh is that there's a question from YouTube? I'll just state it out because I'm not sure I fully understand it. So is that given that um meristemic uh, meristematic growth was the leading growth method for the stem roots? I was wondering what the insight initially motivates the stretching theory uh, for the flowers shown earlier in the talk. Oh. Could you read the second part? Uh, so I got yeah. the meristematic growth for, yeah. for shoots. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's helpful. Uh, let me look at that. What insights initially motivated the stretching theory? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, <laughs> I was skeptical. So the first thing that we did was just to paint on the outside of a spur and then take a video of it growing if it was just adding material, the paint would stay there and more spur would come. But immediately I saw the, spaint, the paint marks elongated. So it, it was a dead giveaway. Um, it just didn't seem right. So we just had to do a quick experiment to find out, yeah, there's something else going on. Well, and we, we also have the, like the a, a kind of very futuristic question, like is that, I now I, after listening to your call, I now see the connection between like using humidity and the renewable energy, but, but from, from the calling, I guess. But I, we wonder like how powerful it is uh, of, this, of this mechanism. Is it possible that we can build like a, a many giant, I don't know, those kind of fiber ribbon you show and then, and then the mega power station out of it? I, I, think, I think it is possible. Um, I've heard some really interesting ideas for using bio-inspired materials, um, for example, above lakes. So uh, apparently there are sort of natural daily humidity cycles. And if you make a material that's made up of a whole bunch of, you know, things inspired by these helices, those will change shape and, you know, actuate this motion, which of course we can use to collect energy. So I, I think it's absolutely possible. I think people are working on it right now. Um, maybe not with my tendril springs that I was studying, but certainly with many, many bio-inspired systems that have, you know, meaningful shape change that takes place just passively using humidity cycles. There's another beautiful example of geranium seeds, which, uh, get ejected, which is also cool, but um, get ejected from the flower and land on the ground and they will not grow unless they drill into the earth, which they do, they self drill into the earth, uh, powered only by humidity cycles. So, you know, yet another example, there's all kinds of fascinating things with plants. And so it, I think it is genuinely going to be useful well, wow, this is super, super eye-opening to me. So yeah, thank you. Thank both of our speakers again. And this basically concludes our the final episode of the Tolonko Geometry Colloquium fourth season. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we also want to thank our artist, uh, Jake Wong, for making the great poster for this week. And we look forward to see you everyone uh, in the next season.